May 4, 2020, Devante Morgan, a 28-year-old son and brother, went on a trip to Mount Shasta, California with his girlfriend. Three days later, on May 7th, Devante's girlfriend reported him missing. She explained that following an argument, Devante left their motel on the morning of May 5th and never returned. Despite extensive investigations by authorities and Devante's family, no trace of him has ever been found. It's been nearly four years since Devante vanished, and investigators are still searching for him. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a former police detective and licensed private investigator. Each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. And if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever platform you use. And real quickly, I want to remind everyone, if, if you want to send me a case, the best place to do that is by emailing us at cases at detectiveperspectivepod.com. Again, that's cases at detectiveperspectivepod.com. We're only taking unsolved cases, so missing cases or, or unsolved homicides. We usually like cases that are later than the 1980s. Anything before that, it gets a little bit more difficult. But however, you know, submit it if you want, and we will take a look at it. But we're always looking for new cases that need exposure. So if you're personally connected to a case or have seen or heard of one in the past that you think needs more coverage, email us and we'll check it out. All right, so for this week's case, Devontae Morgan relatively new, only four years old, would not consider this cold yet. Um, although as we get into this, you will see that initially there was some promising evidence. We, we're going to have video footage in this one. We're going to have um, a witness, if you want to call it that, uh, who was last with Devante before he went missing. We'll, we'll dive into all that. And overall, this case to me just seems like we have people working it, but they just don't have any real information to go off from here. It does seem like the community in which Devante went missing was more than cooperative. It's a smaller community. And as you will see, there were multiple people who came forward uh, with sightings of Devante. And yet here we are four years later, unsure if he's still with us or if he's passed, unsure if he's uh, out there somewhere, um, not wanting to be found. There's a lot of unanswered questions here, but ultimately Devante's family has been working his case since day one, and, and they really want answers. They want to know what happened to him, and we're hoping by covering this that maybe we're one small cog in the machine that ultimately finds out what happened to Devontae Morgan. So without wasting any more time, let's dive right into the case. Born on March 15th, 1992, Devontae Van Morgan, known as Vontae by his loved ones, grew up in San Francisco, California with his mom, Terry, and his younger brother, Anthony. From a young age, Devante was popular. He had a magnetic personality that drew people to him. He was also musically talented and enjoyed singing, freestyle rapping, and playing the drums and piano. There was another thing about Devante that stood out. He loved his family endlessly, and they were his entire world. Even as an adult, he preferred staying close to home to be near them, and he made sure to never miss a family gathering. In 2017, Devante, now 25 years old, was sitting on his mom's front porch trying to enjoy some quality family time when the unimaginable happened. Someone drove by and shot at him, thinking he was someone else. He was struck in the pelvis and the hand and had to be rushed to the hospital. Though Devante survived his injuries, his brother Anthony told Investigation Discovery that Devante struggled with the feeling that his life was over. He was dealing with physical pain and walked with a limp which left him depressed. Additionally, the trauma of being shot on his mom's front porch, a place he considered to be safe, 
weighed heavily on him. Two years later, in 2019, Devante was still struggling with the aftermath of the shooting when he attended a concert and met a woman 20 years older than him. They quickly became inseparable, and they started dating. Now, this woman's name hasn't been released publicly, so I'm going to refer to her as Sierra, which is obviously a fake name. Devante's family told Investigation Discovery that it wasn't long before Sierra began pulling Devante out of his comfort zone by taking him to places he hadn't visited before, like Las Vegas. While this initially seemed like a positive thing, Devante's family soon noticed red flags in the relationship. The couple appeared unhappy and frequently argued. And according to Devante's family, Sierra was very demanding and constantly picked fights about everything. The couple faced some challenges, but they stuck together. And on May 4th, 2020, they decided to get away from San Francisco for a bit and go four hours north to a new place, Mount Shasta, California, which is near the California-Oregon border. They planned just one night away because Devante's nephew had a birthday party the next day and he needed to be back in San Francisco in time to attend. Devante and Sierra rented a car and drove to Mount Shasta where they booked a room at the Cold Creek Inn on North Mount Shasta Boulevard. Once settled in, Devante wanted to talk to his brother, but his phone was broken, so he borrowed Sierra's phone instead. Anthony later remembered that during their chat, Devante seemed relaxed, peaceful, and happy to be somewhere new. Little did Anthony know, it would be the last conversation he'd ever have with his brother. On the evening of May 5th, Sierra called Anthony and told him that she and Devante had argued earlier in the day and Devante left and never came back. Anthony later told Investigation Discovery that he didn't hear any distress or worry in Sierra's voice during the call, so based on her tone, he didn't seem to think it was an emergency, so Anthony assumed Devante might just be out blowing off some steam and trying to cool off, which he had done in the past before when arguing with Sierra. However, two days later, on the morning of May 7th, Sierra called Anthony and his aunt Ruthie and informed them that Devante had never returned. They immediately knew something was wrong. Devante wouldn't just disappear without contacting anyone. Ruthie told Sierra that the family was going to drive up to Mount Shasta to search for Devante, and in the meantime, Sierra needed to report him missing. Now, there are two accounts of what Sierra told police when she reported him missing. According to NBC5's reporting, Sierra said that she and Devante got into an argument on the night of May 4th, and she broke up with him. Despite this, they spent the night together at the motel. The following morning, she left to take a walk and catch the sunrise, which occurred just before 6 a.m. Sierra mentioned that when she returned to the motel around 9.30 a.m., she passed Devante, but he still seemed upset, so they didn't speak. Sierra said that this was the last time she saw Devante, and she noted that he didn't have his phone, but he did have his wallet. However, she wasn't sure if he had any cash. Additionally, she mentioned that he might have had the rental car key with him as well. Now, Investigation Discovery tells a different story. According to their reporting, Sierra informed the police that in the early morning hours of May 5th, she was awakened by Devante, who wanted her to go outside and smoke a cigarette with him. Sierra was irritated by being woken up for this, and she let him know about it. Now, after going outside, when the couple attempted to return to the motel room, they realized that they had left the key inside. They had to contact the after-hours service to let them back in, and the on-call manager was able to assist them. Once they were back in the room, they argued into the morning hours. Eventually, they went their separate ways to cool off. They both left the motel. Sierra went to watch the sunrise, while Devante headed in the opposite direction. At around 9.30 a.m., as Sierra returned to the motel, she saw Devante on the other side of the street walking on North Mount Shasta Boulevard. He still looked mad, so she went back to the hotel without speaking to him. Sierra explained to the police that it was common for her and Devante to spend time apart to calm down after arguments. However, it wasn't normal for Devante to be gone more than 24 hours. Now, just for the record, I don't know if Sierra had told two different stories or maybe NBC and Discovery ID just relayed the information differently. So let's just keep that in mind as we move forward. Now, the police later told Investigation Discovery that when Sierra reported Devante missing, she didn't seem upset or concerned. Instead, they described her as being all over the place and quote-unquote loony. That was their words, not mine. And because Sierra didn't seem to be too worried, the police initially figured that Devante was okay and might have just stayed at a different hotel to get away from Sierra. 
When Devante's family arrived in Mount Shasta, they talked to Sierra, but she was completely unhelpful. According to Anthony, she spoke in riddles and made little sense, as if her mind was constantly spinning and she was just blurting out whatever came to mind. For example, she said something along the lines of, quote, Devante's here, I can feel him here. Oh, I think he's crazy. But this doesn't make sense, because if the trees started talking to the moon and the moon started talking to the stars, and she just kept going on like that. Now, this might seem exaggerated, but I looked at Sierra's Facebook and she does have a, let's just say she has a unique way with words. And I'll throw that up on the screen right here so you can see it for yourself if you're watching on YouTube. And with all of these riddles, Devante's family struggled to take Sierra seriously. Initially, they tried to trust her as she was the only one with any leads on Devante. However, her behavior made them wonder if she was intentionally trying to throw them off the trail. They started to question if she had something to do with Devante's disappearance. The family sat down with the Mount Shasta police and they expressed their concerns about Devante's whereabouts. Each family member emphasized that Devante was very close to his family and he would never leave without reaching out first. They made it clear that something was wrong. After witnessing the family's genuine concern for Devante, the police began to take his disappearance seriously. They entered his information into the missing persons database and posted on social media in hopes of generating leads. They also checked hotels, county buses, taxi services, Greyhound bus lines, and Amtrak in Siskiyou County, but found no record of Devante using any of these services. Unfortunately, this was about all the Mount Shasta police could do to search for Devante. They later explained to Investigation Discovery that the department is very small. They don't have any detectives or any search dogs, and there's only one officer on duty at a time. All of these factors made it very difficult to conduct the type of search that was needed to locate Devante. Because the police weren't making much progress, Devante's family decided to stay in town. They put up posters everywhere, talked to people on the streets, and conducted searches. They even ventured into the mountains and walked for miles through the campgrounds, but despite their efforts, there was no sign of Devante anywhere. Meanwhile, according to the family, Sierra kept telling them statements like, quote, Devante is going to show up on a specific day. He's going to manifest. She also frequently talked about emotions, expressing how upset she felt and how being in Mount Shasta affected her emotionally. This was obviously quite distracting for Devante's family, so eventually they asked Sierra to return to San Francisco. After she left, they didn't hear from her much. She didn't ask about the searches or check in to see if there was any updates. She just kind of fell off the map. However, the family remained in town and continued to distribute flyers, engage with locals, and search for evidence. Thankfully, the police started receiving tips. According to Investigation Discovery, one tip came from a woman who said she heard a couple fighting outside of her house, which was just north of the motel, and this was around 9.30 a.m. on May 5th. The police believed the arguing couple could be Sierra and Devante, and they were particularly interested in this tip because it conflicted what Sierra had claimed originally, which was that she and Devante passed each other near the hotel around 9.30 a.m., but they didn't speak. This new information made the police doubt Sierra's story, but they didn't have any evidence to prove that she was involved with Devante's disappearance. However, they did reclassify the case as suspicious. At around the same time, the police also got a tip that between 9.30 and 10 a.m. on May 5th, a Mount Shasta mail carrier saw Devante in the area of Rockefeller Drive and Alma Street. Devante seemed a bit confused and asked for directions to a motel on Alma Street. The mail carrier informed him that there weren't any motels on Alma, but there was an apartment complex and he provided Devante with the directions. Not long after that, the mail carrier spotted Devante on Alma Street, but not near the apartment complex. So he pulled over and directed him towards the apartment complex again. Soon after that second encounter, he saw Devante again off Rockefeller on Ski Bowl Drive, but this time he didn't stop to speak with him. Hoping to gather more leads, the police asked Mount Shasta residents and business owners to check their surveillance cameras for any footage of Devante on May 5th. Through all the submitted footage, the police were able to track down 10 cameras at six different locations, which captured Devante walking around the small town between 9.14 a.m. and 10 a.m. The first footage of Devante was at 9.14 a.m. as he walked in front of the police department. He then proceeded to a nearby Valero gas station on Lake Street 
where he made a cash purchase before returning in the direction he came from. The next recorded sighting was at 9.40 a.m. as he passed by Jefferson Soul store on North Mount Shasta Boulevard, which is in close proximity to both the Valero gas station and the police department. Two minutes later, he was seen passing back by Jefferson Soul again, heading back in the direction he came from. At 9.48 a.m., Devante was seen heading north on Chestnut Street, then making a right-hand turn onto Alma Street. He kept walking east on Alma until he got to Rockefeller Drive. At 10 a.m., a camera at Sisson School captured Devante crossing Rockefeller and turning west, heading down Rockefeller, which would lead him right back to the motel if he continued. Unfortunately, this was the last captured footage of Devante, so the police were unsure if he continued going toward the motel, if someone picked him up, or if something completely different occurred. The police noted that in the footage, Devante didn't appear to be under the influence of anything. To them, it seemed as if he was just out on a nice day taking a stroll around town. The places he walked were all safe and normal and within close proximity to the motel. After pinpointing the last time Devante could be seen on camera, the police watched surveillance video for a consecutive 72-hour time period, but they didn't see him on any video footage again. At this point, it became clear that the police needed to search for Devante in the areas he had last been seen, but in order to do that, they needed to reach out to outside help. According to the Mount Shasta Herald, the police requested assistance from both the Siskiyou County Sheriff's Department search and rescue team and the Southern Oregon search and rescue team. The two teams, along with police, family members, volunteers, and cadaver dogs, conducted a grid search of all areas within approximately one mile of where Devante was last seen. Despite these efforts, no trace of Devante was found anywhere. While conducting physical searches, the police also tracked Devante's phone and financial records. According to NBC5, cell phone records indicated Devante's phone was last pinged in San Francisco on May 3rd, the day before he arrived in Mount Shasta. This aligned with the fact that Devante's phone was broken and he hadn't been able to use it on his trip. The police then conducted a manual ping, which confirmed that the phone had not been used or turned on since May 3rd. The police also tracked two bank cards that had been in Devante's possession when he disappeared. They found that one card was actually in the possession of a family member and had been used one time, while the other remained unused. Additionally, the department filled out a search warrant for a Chime credit card believed to be in Devante's possession. However, that request was denied, preventing the police from confirming whether the card had been used or not. Now, when it comes to this particular incident, without knowing the details of why it was denied, it would be unfair for me to completely go in on Chime on this one. It could have, The paperwork could have been filled out improperly. There could have been something where the, the credit card itself did not belong to Devante and based on policies of the credit card company, they weren't able to divulge information about a card that wasn't owned by the person in question. All this said, there's got to be more to the story or maybe later down the road that information was obtained, but law enforcement has never come out publicly and said it. But I will say there are instances based on technicalities where law enforcement is looking for a particular individual and we will do a affidavit, a search warrant, or an administrative subpoena. And there are cases with these bigger companies where they do deny you. You need more information. You need something signed by a judge before they'll give it to you because they have policies in place as well. And they're trying to avoid potential litigation where maybe there's someone who wants to be left alone and, and doesn't want to be found. And they disclose this information to law enforcement without the consent or permission of the owner. And so it's a balance. It is something that we have to deal with as investigators, but I'm not going to sit here and say that it's this huge issue where we need to change it. For the most part, if you use common sense and you do the right paperwork, the uh, telephone companies and these communication services will cooperate with you and are, are usually great assistance. By mid-May, there was still no sign of Devante, so his family began offering a $25,000 reward for information leading to his whereabouts. His grandmother also issued a public plea stating, quote, We just need you to come home. Get in touch with your grandmother. You know my phone number by memory. 
Get in touch with the police department. Get in touch. Get home. The family also hired a private investigator, a decision supported by the Mount Shasta Police Department. They met with the PI and fully disclosed all relevant facts and information pertaining to the investigation. And I will say, this is awesome to hear. It's great when you have a police department who acknowledges their shortcomings and realizes they may not know everything. And even if they are capable of handling this case, having an outside party with uh, relevant experience come in to take a second look at the facts and see if they see something differently that may assist in finding Devante, it's awesome to hear. And I'm not saying that as a PI myself, I know I'm a little biased, but this is a case that's relatively new and in most instances would not be opened up to outside entities, not within uh, the law enforcement community. But clearly Mount Shasta from the beginning here has said right out, you know, listen, our capabilities are limited. We can use all the help we can get. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear that they were cooperative and on board with this and, and provided the information to the private investigator needed for him or her to do their job as well. As May turned into June, Devante's family remained in Mount Shasta and continued to distribute flyers, knock on doors, and also conduct even more searches. But with no sign of Devante anywhere, the family eventually had to return to San Francisco. The Mount Shasta police chief told ABC7 that, at that point, he didn't have any solid theories on what happened to Devante. The investigation was still being treated as a missing persons case, although the circumstances surrounding Devante's disappearance were considered, quote, highly unusual and suspicious. By May of 2021, a year had passed since Devante went missing. The Mount Shasta police reported that they were continuing to investigate any leads and remained hopeful for a resolution in the case. During this time, Devante's mother Terry spoke to NBC5, expressing her belief that Sierra knew more than she had disclosed. Terry emphasized, quote, that young woman knows what happened to him. My son was a child of God, funny, loving, beautiful, and everybody loves him. He would not just leave us like that. May 2022 marked two years since Devante went missing. Terry told NBC5 that she felt like she was losing her mind over her son's disappearance. She explained that Devante wasn't just her son, he was also her best friend, and she missed him dearly. Terry expressed her determination to never give up on finding Devante, mentioning that she continued to post flyers whenever she went to Mount Shasta. In May of 2023, three years had passed since Devante disappeared. The Mount Shasta Police Department reassured the public that the case remained open and under investigation. They said they still considered Devante's disappearance suspicious, and they had identified Sierra as a person of interest, but not a suspect. In September of 2023, Investigation Discovery released an episode of Disappeared focusing on Devante's disappearance. His mom Terry and his aunt Ruthie both expressed concerns about Sierra's story. The police also stated they believe Sierra knows more than she's telling, though they admittedly don't have anything to charge her with. Other family members speculated whether Devante may have fallen victim to foul play at the hands of a local. His brother Anthony thinks it's possible he was targeted because he was an outsider from San Francisco. Unfortunately, this is the latest update we have in Devante's case. As the four-year mark approaches, his family asks everyone to share Devante's name and story, and if anyone has information, please come forward. The family is desperate for answers, and they just want to bring Devante home. All right, let's get right into this perspective, because it's going to be pretty clear-cut, right to the point, for the possible scenarios here. But before we get into the scenarios, I want to talk about Sierra. And the reason I want to talk about Sierra is I know on the surface, her behavior sounds very suspicious, especially some of the things she said and, and how she has said them. Like I said, the police department referring to her as, as loony, their words. Here's what I'll say about that. I don't necessarily disagree with the assessment on, on the surface, but I will say when we as detectives are trying to determine if someone is being deceptive with us, there's not some telltale behavior or word that indicates definitively that they're lying. What we normally have to do is develop a baseline for that person and we'll ask them a series of controlled questions 
that are not stressful that they would be able to answer pretty easily without creating any level of anxiety. And then after developing that baseline, we will then ask them the more specific, you know, targeted questions where we can now judge that behavior and their way they phrase words and how they speak with how they were acting during the baseline questioning. And we can compare the two and contrast and see if there's a similarity or to see if there's differences and we can make note of that. Why do I bring that up? Well, Sierra's behavior is probably going to be considered suspicious or abnormal to 90% of us. However, is this the normal behavior for her? I would want to ask more questions to Devante's family and Sierra's family to find out if this behavior, this type of wording that she's doing, using on Facebook is something that she's done for an extended period of time, or is this type of behavior something that developed after Devante's disappearance. That would be a big indicator for me if something transpired during their time out in, in Mount Shasta. So I don't want to immediately say that, yeah, you know what? Sierra's acting strange. She's definitely lying about something. She definitely knows more because this may be a normal occurrence for her and she may have been acting this way even before this whole incident transpired. But based on what we know, especially with what Terry has said, Devante's mom, she believes that Sierra knows more. And there may that may be answering my question where maybe she wasn't acting like this beforehand and that's why Terry's coming to this conclusion. But without knowing more information about Sierra personally, it's hard for me to sit here in this chair and, and, and judge her too critically without knowing all the facts and circumstances to her background, her uh, normal behavior. And again, just to bring it back to this, what's her baseline? I would need to have an interview with her to determine how she is normally as opposed to how she's acting when asked questions specifically about Devante. But now let's turn our attention to the scenarios because there's three or four that I think are potentially possible here as far as what could have taken place. The first one, An argument ensues between Sierra and Devante. There's some type of altercation after Devante gets back from his walk, which we know that he was seen multiple times on. And during this argument and during this interaction, it becomes violent and and Devante's hurt during the altercation. I don't know how that would be, but somehow he's hurt by Sierra and Sierra is able to uh, transport him somewhere else where he has not been found yet. He, and at this point, he would no longer be with us. I always say this with everything. Yes, it's possible. Is it likely in my opinion? No. I feel like with the neighbors that we had who heard the argument earlier in the day, if there was an altercation later in the day, maybe a gunshot or something like that maybe takes place, they would have heard it. They would have heard this altercation again. For the most part here, you know, barring some discrepancies, Sierra's account of what transpired is pretty accurate. You know, she said that they had this fight. He, Devante went out for a walk. She went out for a walk. They were not together. Those time frames essentially line up for the most part. And as I said earlier, the discrepancies in the story may not be contributed to Sierra. It may be something with NBC and, and investigation discovery where, The wires were crossed or they decided to convey the information differently in their reporting. There's a lot of factors there. But for the most part, being critical, her story's not way off where she said, yeah, this is the last time I saw him and we have physical evidence to show she was with him later that evening. You know, it's it's not that far of a difference between what she has told police. And I'll also say that if this happened and they were not together— Whatever occurred between them that became violent would have most likely been at that motel and she would have had the 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 burden of disposing of Devante without being apprehended, without being caught or without being seen. Wouldn't there be some type of forensic evidence to indicate that? Was the motel room processed in this whole situation? Uh, do we, was there any signs of a, a violent struggle or someone being injured? And then the bigger question, how would she transport Devante if it was against his will? If, or if he was no longer conscious and capable of defending himself, how would she do all this? I think you will find, and I think most of you will agree, in most instances with cases like this, it's usually the other way around, where if it's a man and a woman, 
usually it's the woman who goes missing and the man is somehow connected to it because he has the capability of not only hurting the woman easier, let's just call it what it is in most cases, but also carrying her or disposing of her body easier as well, just due to his own physical attributes. And we know that Devante was approximately 5'11", 165 to 170 pounds. So not a huge guy, but not tiny. And he seemed like he was in decent shape. So I feel like it would be very hard for Sierra to overpower him unless there was a weapon involved. And if it was a gun or a knife where there was this major altercation, I think the same neighbor that heard them arguing in the morning would most likely have heard them in the afternoon. So let's turn our attention to a couple other scenarios. Quick one, Devante's out on a walk. After he's last seen on camera, he takes a detour, maybe heads toward the mountains because he wants to go on more of a hike or something, doesn't want to go back to the hotel yet. Maybe Sierra's right. Maybe she does see him while walking near the hotel or, or the motel and he makes because he sees her, he decides not to go back because he doesn't want to have another confrontation. He may go off in the woods and he may get hurt or be attacked by an animal potentially. Something could have went down out there and maybe that's why we've never found him. But again, I, that's not at the top of my list. To me, there's two scenarios that are more likely. The first being, as soon as we see him on camera, the last time we see him on camera, someone approaches him, maybe befriends him. They start talking. It could be a male or a female, right? They decide to offer him a ride. They're going to take him somewhere. Uh, he gets in the car and th not knowing that this person has malicious intentions or this person, maybe a female, brings him to a location where the people there have malicious intentions. Um, that could be the case. And if that's the case, there's very little evidentiary value left behind that could show or indicate that happened. And it would be really hard to find him at this point. The final scenario I want to bring up, and I, I'm not someone who throws around race often in these cases, you know, that unless I have something that tells me I need to. And in this case, I don't know if this is going to be a factor, but I think it's worth bringing up. So I looked up Mount Shasta and I have this, the stats here and I'm, I'm going off CaliforniaDemographics.com. So some of you in the comments may have different numbers. And if you do, please share them. But for what I'm seeing, Mount Shasta has a population of approximately 3,200 people. The median age is 52.7, so an older population, and it's 83.7% white. So could we have a scenario where it's earlier in the day and Devante is walking around town and there's a group of individuals who don't necessarily like that he's walking around their town and there could be a confrontation that escalates and Maybe something occurs where Devante is hurt or even killed, and then he's taken to a, a, a different location where he's never going to be found. And this isn't just some random thing that I'm throwing out there without any substance to it. It's one of those situations where Devante's own family, Anthony, his brother, has suggested this might be possible. And as I said in the story, it could be because he's a quote-unquote outsider from San Francisco. Well, how would you know that from just looking at him? You wouldn't. There could be something more to it. I'm not trying to be controversial here. I'm just pointing out what I'm seeing. For all I know, Mount Shasta is, is a great community. It does seem like a lot of people cooperated with the investigation to even get us where we are today. But I'm just pointing out a reality that we live in a world where certain people, specifically people of color, are not welcomed in certain areas. And could there have been individuals who were uncomfortable seeing someone who looked like Devante walking around their community and not really appearing to have a destination, right? I, this case kind of reminds me to a certain degree, although different circumstances, Ahmaud Aubrey, if you guys know that case, and if you don't look it up, but another black man who's going through a property, there's some dispute whether or not he was trying to steal something at this construction site. Either way, there was a group of individuals who did not like him there, and they decided to take things into their own hands and it resulted in Ahmad being killed. Uh, the people that killed him are now in prison. But could this be one of those situations? I think it's possible. And if that's the case, it may explain why we don't have answers to this day. 
Because if the people responsible for this are from that community and grew up there, they would absolutely know where to bring someone so that they would never be found. Now, obviously, I hope that's not the case. I hope we have a situation here where, for some reason or another, Devante just wanted to get away, just wanted to start a new life. And although the financial records and the, the cell phone pings don't necessarily suggest that because he didn't even have a phone on him when he, when he disappeared, maybe he just wanted to start a new life. And I, and I hold on to that hope for his mother, Terry, and his aunt, Ruthie, that maybe that is the case. And maybe he is still out there. And maybe he'll see something from this or something else and decide to come forward to at least let them know that he's okay. That's my hope. And that's why I'm classifying this case in this, in this episode as a missing person. Because we have no reason to conclude that he's not still alive. And we're going to hold on to that hope. And obviously, my thoughts are with Devontae's family and obviously Anthony as well. I don't want to leave him out. We're all rooting for you guys. And we're here to support you. And hopefully, this case is still relatively new. I know that there have been a couple different agencies involved. Maybe the FBI will be involved as well. We know that there's a PI working the case. Um, so there's some options here. And it's still, it's still early. And, and also maybe Sierra comes around. Maybe she gives us more information. So we'll see how it all plays out. And I'm hoping someone out there who's watching or listening to this episode uh, may know something. And if you do, please contact authorities immediately. And just for everyone out there, I'm going to give a quick recap like I always do. Devontae Morgan was last seen on May 5th, 2020 at around 10 a.m. walking west on Rockefeller Drive in Mount Shasta, California. He was wearing a black knit turtleneck shirt black sweatpants with a white line, and San Francisco 49ers rubber slides. Devante is black, 5'11", 165 pounds with short black hair and brown eyes. He has a slender build, a mustache, a goatee, and he walks with a slight limp. Devante has multiple tattoos, including a money bag, on the top of his left hand. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Mount Shasta Police Department at 530 926 Seven five four zero. Real quick on a lighter note for my people that are watching on YouTube, because uh, I know I have some detectives out there who are very aware of the details. And some of you may have noticed I'm wearing the same shirt from last week. Very observant of you. I actually came in earlier today to record an ad from last week's episode that I hadn't done. And I was planning on changing my shirt before the episode, but I was so excited about getting into Devante's case that I... Didn't realize it until 45 minutes in that I was still wearing the same shirt. But at that point, it's too late. I got to stay committed. But again, for my YouTube people, just for proof, here's the shirt. It's right here. Just forgot to throw it on. So I just want to assure all of you I'm not losing my mind. I'm not wearing this the same shirt two weeks in a row. But let's be honest. What I'm wearing really doesn't matter. It's about this case. It's about these families. And it's about the victims. That's what we're here for. And that's what we're going to stay focused on. But I just want to put that out there. So with that all being said, I'm going to go change my shirt. Everyone stay safe out there and I'll see you next week.